So with that said, um, I'd like to get started here. The eighth annual Langen Lecture is titled Pathways to Mitigate the Impact of Climate Change, a Case Study on Geothermal Energy Foundations. It'll be presented by uh, Professor Tuche Bashir, who is a PhD and a professor at the University of Illinois at the Urba, Urbana-Champaign Campus Department of Civil Environmental Engineering. Uh, before I give the professor her full intro, I'm gonna take care of some quick housekeeping items. Oop. First, the upcoming events. Uh, the next lecture in the lecture series will be the William H. Muser and Philip C. Rutledge Memorial Lecture, which will be sometime mid-November. The exact date is not set yet. And we're very excited to announce that the 47th annual Martin S. Cap Lecture, as well as the 46th annual One Day May Seminar are both going to be in-person events this year. Uh, currently, we have the Cap Lecture set up for Thursday, January 13th. Um, the topic and lecture are to TBD, but keep a lookout in your email for those coming through soon. Uh, also, just to start getting this on everyone's radar, the 2022 ASC GI Met Annual Graduate Scholarship. Again, this is available for graduate students pursuing a geotechnical degree within the New York City metropolitan area, Long Island, and Lower Hudson Valley. Um, if you're curious about more information ahead of time, you reach out to Aaron Zetcha, um, email on the screen below. I'd like to thank the committee uh, for getting this lecture organized as well as starting to organize some of our other great lectures like the CAP and the May seminar. And everyone who needs a PDH, don't worry, your certificate will be sent to you via email for your record keeping purposes once all the poll questions are complete. And lastly, I'd like to thank the this lecture sponsor, Langen. Um, Langen's a multidisciplinary firm been in business now for over 50 years, projects in over 100 countries, and have over 1,300 employees now. So thanks, Langan. And with that, I'm going to introduce the professor. Uh, professor Tuche Bashir is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Illinois, as I mentioned. Her research interests include unsaturated soil mechanics, energy geotechnics, climate change-related subsurface multi-physics phenomena, and sustainable geoenergy applications. Over the years, Dr. Bashir has been awarded honors by international institutions as well as invited to keynote speakers to several conferences. She received the ISSMGE Bright Spark Lecture Award in 2019 for her achievements in the area of energy geotechnics. And Dr. Bashir was also awarded the 2020 Young Investigator Program and Defense Instrumentation Program Award at AFOSR for her research on multi-physics behavior of geomaterials. She holds a PhD in geotechnical engineering from the University of California, San Diego, and is a member of ISS, MGE, ASCE, and CGS, where she is actively engaged with the students, the professionals, as well as overall diversity development. So with that, I will let Professor Tuche take it away, and we will get started with her presentation. Okay. So all good? You can see my screen, you can hear me well. Okay. Good evening, everyone, or good afternoon if you're in the West Coast. Um, it's my greatest um, honor and pleasure to give the uh, eighth Langen lecture today um, for this audience. So today I am going to talk about a case study on geothermal energy foundations. And this uh, has been my area of research uh, since I started my PhD work back in 2013. And um, this talk is very important to me, uh, for me, not only because I get to share my research work with you, with all of you, but also I will be presenting on um, a research that, that I had a chance to, to perform research on a building that Langan was um, very supportive of with their contributions uh, on, the camp, on the Urbana campus of uh, University of Illinois. So before I dive into um, energy foundations, I like to talk a little bit about uh, my research work. My research group and I have been focusing on uh, responding to climate change. So as you all know, climate change is one of the, the most important global crises um, in the world. It's recognized as one of the uh, most important um, challenges uh, of the 21st century. So uh, to respond to this 
uh, problem, the global challenge my research group and I have been working on mitigation and adaptation strategies um, to climate change. So these include, um, just a second, so these, um, in, these efforts include harvesting geoenergy, including energy piles, energy foundations, geothermal energy foundations, energy shelves, whatever you want to call it, you name it, um, uh, energy tunnels, and also um, um, working on deep um, oil and gas wells to plug them to um, mitigate the or um, seal the uh, these abandoned oil and gas wells uh, to to eliminate the methane leak pathways and methane emissions into the atmosphere, and also um, these in, uh, the research efforts includes prediction authority, especially this research uh, is on. It, it, it's closely related with the um, Arctic um, subsurface. And while we're doing all of these together, uh, we believe that um, the, res the results of the research that we've been performing as academics uh, is very important to integrate into this education and curriculum um, at the university so that um, so we are educating the new generations of civil engineers and environmental engineers to be aware of these uh, global challenges worldwide. And, okay, moving on. So um, our research has a couple of uh, global impact areas. So these are a uh, couple of challenges that I, are identified by the United Nations. So um, our research touches uh, for uh, to affordable and clean energy um, and climate action plans and that con also contributes to sustainable cities and communities. So the challenges with the climate change as identified, and I just mentioned before, here what really concerns us as civil engineers is the sustainable urban development. So the energy, um, the, the, the world's population is increasing steadily. And these um, energy growth, I'm sorry, these population growth um, increases the energy demand. And because of the climate crisis, there are some climate refugees because of the um, extreme events that they are exposed to. So these all result in um, urbanization and also um, population growth, in, especially in the urban areas. So that's why we have to come up with the strategies to be able to provide uh, to be able to provide strategies for sustainable urban development. So with the urbanization and growing population. So there are 10 billion of tons of concrete produced every year globally. And with that, uh, of these amount, 3 billion is injected into the ground back. And this number, 7 billion tons of concrete uh, production, contributes to the 8% uh, of the world's uh, CO2 emissions into the atmosphere. So another challenge for us as civil engineers um, to think about is the energy usage with increasing population again. So in this figure, you're looking at the greenhouse gas emissions by sector with electricity distribution, especially if you focus on here, residential and commercial buildings are responsible for more than this number is shown as 32%, but it's just renewed. This number is 40%, more than 40% of the electricity usage in the US, <clears throat> sorry, in the US are responsible um, for the greenhouse gas emissions. And especially when we focus on big cities like New York, so this energy contributes to 71% of the carbon dioxide emissions of the city, which is a really, really big number. So then what, what are we going to do or what have we been doing about this? So one option um, is to, uh, to come up with the clean and sustainable energy strategies, including closed up systems, or um, in other words, they're called ground source heat pump systems. So you, 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 some of you may be familiar with the concept. So uh, this concept includes um, harvesting the constant heat budget of the subsurface. It can be either shallow subsurface or deeper subsurface, doesn't matter. But we are taking advantage of the, the heat of the subsurface and to, to provide heating and also cooling uh, into the buildings. This concept here was developed maybe 70, 100 years ago back in Europe 
Um, so and it started as uh, just the um, borehole or borehole systems or trench systems like horizontal trenching systems, vertical borehole systems, or even in the case of pond and lake, which we um, see examples, especially in the United States as well. I believe a couple of airports has been using this um, lakes and ponds to provide heating and cooling into the airports. Um, so the concept here, um, so we dig uh, trenches or we drill boreholes and we um, construct a closed loop system where we circulate a fluid through these piping system and um, to exchange heat between the fluid in, in the pipes and the surrounding ground uh, and extract heat or inject heat into the ground. So, um, what's, so what's the motivation here? Um, so you're looking at a figure, this is the figure um, isotherms uh, of the subsurface uh, mean annual temperature, subsurface temperatures of uh, in the United States. So for example, you see you're looking at the state of Illinois, um, the subsurface temperatures are around 51, um, ranges between 54, 51 de de degrees Fahrenheit in this um, part of, um, in this part of uh, the United States. So this heat is constant throughout the year and um, this heat is, uh, this temp these temperature values are constant until we get into a deeper subsurface where the geothermal gradients are in effect. And if you just recall from maybe previous, um, from college uh, times, uh, college courses, geothermal gradient um, is um, effective every, uh, geothermal gradient um, is, uh, the, the subsurface temperature increases by one degree Celsius every 32, 33 meters. Okay, so that means you're good until 30 meter without any change in the subsurface. So because of this constant heat, in this case, we are we are exchanging heat with the fluid and the surrounding ground here, and this heat is constantly being replaced by the surrounding ground. So that's why it's uh, renewable. So another option is to implement this concept into the foundations. So you know, or you all know, the foundations are to support um, the, the the structural loads, the service loads are uh, transferred to this uh, the ground. And here, if we apply this concept, we construct in this case um, the closed loop systems within the structural elements of a foundation, a concrete or a, um, a usually it's concrete, uh, into the piles where we exchange heat with, between the piles and the surrounding ground in this case. So these are all uh, directed to a heat pump system in a building. And these heat pump systems are usually um, air and water coupled. So this is where the, the piping system will bring either heated or cooled water into this heat pump. And this is where the heat exchange occurs. And then so you have your nice and comfortable temperature uh, in your apartment or in your house, wherever uh, you're, you're living. So, so this, this concept, again, can be extended uh, to different uh, structures, geostructures. So here you're looking at examples of um, energy foundations, like bridge foundation, energy foundations for buildings, even like bridge foundations for maybe uh, bridge deck de-icing. And even maybe there's a new concept to include, uh, to install these uh, closed loop pipes into the tunnels. There is in fact a um, recent project going on in Switzerland uh, this is where um, I believe um, they collected in Lausanne. This is uh, where they collected their first um, field experimental data, and um, currently they are analyzing it for um, further um, research purposes. So, uh, for the purpose of this um, presentation, of course, we are going to focus on energy pile concept, energy foundation, energy pile, or geothermal energy foundations concept here. So let's take a look how they come together. Um, we have this deep foundation. It can be a micro pile, a drill shaft, or even a CFA. And this is where we attach our geothermal loops. They are I, they are usually high density high density polyethylene uh, pipes. 
and they're attached to, so you're looking at the drill strap with the rebar um, cage, so they're usually attached to the rebar cages here. And so you can install multiple loops, continuous loops, single loops. There are multiple versions uh, that, um, that came along uh, since these were um, proposed. Um, there are, um, and they are designed based on the heating and cooling needs from the building. So, okay, we converted these the foundations to become an energy pile. So then what should we expect? So in this case, we are imposing either heating or cooling to the piles, right? So we, are ex we, we, we already mentioned that we're ex uh, expecting some heat exchange and this heat exchange decreases decrease or increases the temperature of the pile and this pile are surrounded by the soil. So this high temperatures or low temperatures are affecting or may affect the soil properties or pile properties, structural uh, mechanical properties itself. So um, you're looking at this figure. So this is where a pile is load. Uh, there's a structural load acting on the pile. And these are the, um, the, the axial load distribution along the pile. And this is in the case of mechanical load only. When we also put the heating, we are just using um, uh, super uh, in, uh, superposition here and um, heating only result in some expansion in the case of heating in the case of cooling there will be some contraction and these will result in um, increased stresses and in, sometimes in the depending on the end restraint conditions that they will cause some um, increased or decreased um, axial deformation within the pile and this is how our mechanical and heating um, axial, mechanic, um, axial loads uh, under the combined mechanical and heating load will look like. Again, similarly, we, we are going to similar. Um, we are going to observe some similar behavior when we cool this pile, and we will expect some decreased um, axial loads, which will which would cause tensile stresses within the pile. But of course. Um, these um, the load transfer mechanisms and the distribution along the pile should be uh, governed by the end restraints. So, for example, you see that different um, mobilization of axial loads for for in the case of floating pile or an end bearing pile. So, this distribution mechanism will be different. So, so we mentioned that. Um, heating or cooling of the pile will result in some differences in the uh, the properties of the pile itself, but of course it's gonna um, it's gonna alter some um, uh, ground properties as well. So, for example, uh, so here you're looking at a figure from the literature that was um, performed in 2007. This is where a clay, low uh, hydraulic conductivity material, geomaterial clay was taken and um, so they were performed some um, undrained triaxial tests under different temperature uh, conditions and for different confining pressures. You will see that with increasing temperature, excess pore water pressure development within the soil uh, increases with increasing temperatures. So these, this soil layer, this clay was cooled down uh, to the room temperature, the starting temp the point temperature, you will see that uh, the pore water pressure would go back to um, the, the original value uh, at the end of the cooling. So this was the clay uh, having an over consolidation ratio of three, by the way. So here we said that there will be some changes in um, pile behavior and also the soil behavior. So here, what we need to look at is the some changes in compression. Ax considerations for the pile soil system is axial compression, possible tension, even changes in shock resistance because there will be some excessive pore water pressure development at, uh, when we start first heating the pile, and these excessive pore water pressures may affect the um, effective stress. So to investigate all of these. Um, we performed a study at the University of Illinois, as I mentioned, in the new civil engineering, civil and environmental engineering building uh, on campus. 
and to characterize the temperature and confining pressures uh, uh, impact effect of uh, temperature and confining pressures on hydraulic properties of glaciers because we believe that this is a thermal hydromechanical multiphysics um, problem and we wanted to develop a constitutive relationship to validate the numerical model that we developed to investigate THM behavior of uh, geomaterials that we have on campus for different boundary conditions in the case of energy foundation. So we will be looking at um, three different aspects of um, the thermal effects on soils and thermal effects on pile at different scales. So for that phase one, um, our research, uh, phase one of our research focused on thermal effects uh, on THM, um, uh, THM behavior uh, of, and we investigated a, um, the thermal effects on fully saturated glacial tills uh, with the computational model that we developed. I wanted to include this slide uh, because we're all engineers and we're all familiar with these concepts, especially with poor elasticity model. So, as you recall, poor elasticity model is the general uh, formulation of the 1D consolidation theory, right? It was developed by um, Biot in uh, 1941. So here, what we did, so we already familiar, we are already familiar with the pore elasticity. So we included this thermal effects in the uh, pore elasticity theory. To do that, um, we actually included uh, thermally induced strains uh, in the. So this, this is a model for um, the surrounding soil. By the way, um, we included this. Um, thermally um, induced strains in our formulation, which was handled very nicely. So um, these are, um, so here this term uh, accounts for the, um, the thermal induced strains uh, here. And we have a static equilibrium as you're all familiar with. And um, here we have conservation of mass. This is our mass balance equation. Here, the term, you see this um, volumetric strains uh, are included um, here. And then we have this um, source term where um, the thermal expansion of the, the soil skeleton and the fluid are also considered with the increased temperatures uh, um, result, uh, resulted by the temperature differences over time. So finally, we have this conservation of energy equation where the first term here is the heat accumulation in our system, soil pile system, and this is the um, the convection. Uh, this is the fluid velocity, which was governed by Darcy law. And where in this um, this is a vector here, which is dependent, um, which is equal to the um, hydraulic conductivity and then the density of the fluid, right? And we know that hydraulic conductivity may change with the changes in temperature and also the fluid density. Um, which in, the case, in this case is water, decreases uh, with um, increasing temperatures. So these are all included in our um, final energy balance equation. So this, is, this term here is called convection and the conduction term, uh, the convection by the way occurs in the fluids and also our conduction term here which only happens in, um, mainly happens in uh, solids. And here on the right hand side, we have uh, the source term. This can be an external heat uh, source or sink. So to sum up here, so we have thermal induced strains, thermal expansion of soil constituents, both skeleton and the fluids, and we have couple heat transfer that results in thermal elasticity model. So why did we select thermal elasticity? Because again, um, so here you're looking at the volumetric strains uh, changes with um, increased temperatures. So this was a, um, this, these are the results from a Pondita Silta clay having an uh, over consolidation ratio of two. You see that uh, when we start heating the soil, um, the volumetric strain develops, but then when we cool it down, it goes back to, um, you know, the, the, the initial value. So similarly, another study on Banco clay uh, at different over consolidation ratios, two, four, and eight, one interesting observation here is that um, for the old consolidation ratio for the heavily consolidated material uh, bank of clay, you see that there will be some, um, so this is the end of heating and this is the end of cooling. You see that there is some uh, strain accumulation 
and for the OCR of four, um, the all the volumetric strains are recoverable. So this is a special case here, the, the third um, um, curve here for the OCR of two. Uh, this is the um, um, this is all, this this, is, this happened because the strain accumulation. This is because um, of the uh, one this particular type of clay. So we have our model. Uh, we know what to expect. So now we can take this model and verify this with um, various um, um, problems in the literature. So what we did, we we found this analytical solution, uh, Booker and Savido, 1985. And we, in, we, we compared our um, numerical simulation results with this analytical solution for a problem of um, buried cylinder here, heated cylinder, and we, kept, we compared our results against evolution of temperature and pore water pressures around this buried cylinder. So you're looking at the comparisons uh, for different uh, distances uh, from the, uh, the heating source and you see that there is almost a perfect match in the temperature and also very considerably good match in the um, excess pore water pressure development. So we were, we were satisfied with these results, but we want, we want, to, invest, we, we want to use our model um, a little bit. We want to take this a little bit further to, to, to verify this for against an undrained uh, triaxial test results. So here is you're looking at a core sample uh, having a 51 millimeter um, in di diameter and 200, 200 millimeter in height. And this was uh, this core sample was um, heated. Uh, here are the, uh, the temperature uh, boundary conditions that was applied within the soil specimen. You know, so there's uh, a top cap and bottom cap where, where uh, you apply um, the, 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 um, um, the, the fluid or air and depending on your um, degree of initial degree of saturation. But in this case, this was a saturated clay specimen, a cowling clay having an OCR of three. Moving on, so here again, looking at uh, you're looking at the results comparisons for the temperatures and um, measured and uh, simulated pore water pressure development, and here the temperatures are also um, the confining fluid uh, temperatures also are plotted. So just for you, a reminder for you, this is location A here, the result from location A here and location B from here. So you see that the temperatures match perfectly um, with, with the experimental results, but there are some discrepancies in the pore water pressure development um, over time. Uh, one interesting observation here, um, the, the, the excessive pore water pressures uh, reached a plateau as soon as the confining fluid reaches at the um, the um, when the, the confining fluid temperatures are stabilized. So another observation here. So here is the predicted temperature change uh, against different um, predicted excess pore fluid pressures for the, um, the the clay having different hydraulic conductivities. And you see that um, when the um, the um, the hydraulic conductivity um, increases, um, the the pore water uh, pressure dissipation um, decreases. The, the rate of the pore water dissipation decreases as expected. So we learned from and an, an, we we verified our numerical model with a um, an optical solution and also a experimental result uh, from the literature, which is very significant. And then we took this model to investigate the implications of these multi-physics phenomena, thermohydromechanical behavior of energy foundations. So again, uh, just to give you a little bit more background, why do we care about the excess pore water pressures here? So this is our um, pile model, and this is the surrounding soil element. If you take a closer look here, Beta S is the, um, the the thermal expansion of this um, the, the the solids, and Beta W here is the um, the thermal expansion of the water. When we heat this uh, soil element, the representative elementary volume, the 
water, the fluid, will expand at a much higher rate and much higher values compared to the solids because the thermal expansion coefficient of water is much higher than the solids. So because of this expansion, there will be some excess pore water pressures. So this excess pore water pressure will decrease the effective um, stress. So here, that's why we care about, um, with these increased um, pore water pressures, we care about the changes in shelf resistance and also pore water pressure development within the, the soil. So, um, to, so we perform those numerical simulations at small scales right now, so we're going to move on to, um, a, to a field scale where we modeled, where we, where we perform numerical simulations in an energy foundation work. Again, we found this study uh, in the literature. Uh, this is where a 30 meter long uh, deep energy pile is embedded in a um, domain, soil domain. And um, so using the same parameters, same initial and boundary conditions, we um, checked our, we developed a 2D axis symmetric model and we um, checked the result, we compared the uh, results um, against changes in axial stresses and also changes in shock resistance, axial stresses within the pile and changes in shock resistance um, at the pile soil interface. As you can see, there's a perfect match, so our model is good to go. Why 2D axis symmetric? Because this is an this may be an axis symmetric problem, but also this is a simpler model compared to 3D models, and uh, this gives us uh, more computational save, computational time saving, uh, and to give us uh, flexibility to investigate some of the parameters that may affect the behavior of thermal thermohydromechanical behavior of um, energy foundations. So we heated this uh, pile for 90 days. So here you're looking at the displacements before the heating, and this is how they mobilize um, after um, heating of 90 days. Sorry, it was um, 100 days. So this is a nice animation that tells you the whole story, actually. So because we said that we are concerned about pore water pressures, also the uh, displacement, so here you're looking at the temperature evolution over time. Um, we are heating the pile and the heat is being dissipated radially and you see that there is a uniform temperature distribution. And if you look at the pore water pressures, so don't forget this is the uniform soil layer. All the properties, initial properties are the same. So even with that, you see that the pore water pressure evolution in the um, 2D um, um, domain. So there are some, if you just like focus here, there's like an initial uh, peak in the pore water pressure and then it starts dissipating over time. Similarly, you're looking at the, uh, the mobilization of displacement during the time of um, heating. So these are again, all expected results. But then we took this model to be perform a parametric study to understand better how the design parameters and also uh, soil properties such as hydraulic conductivity have an impact on the results or the, on the performance of the, um, the energy piles. So here you're looking at a figure on the left where we kept the fluid temperature as constant and we changed the hydro conductivity. As you can see, as the hydro conductivity decreased, um, pore water pressure um, values uh, increased. In a similar way, here we um, changed the, um, the fluid temperatures because we know that we won't be injecting a fluid at this constant temperature all the time. So that's why we changed these temperatures, uh, fluid temperatures, and we kept everything same. And you're looking at the time series of pore water pressure development here. Uh, with the increased fluid temperatures, of course, um, as we expected, the pore water pressure uh, values increased. But you see in the case of 50 degrees Celsius, there is like a clear peak uh, compared to others, and then the dissipation over time. Moving on. Here you're looking at the um, profiles of pore water pressure at the pile soil interface for different types of heating. And um, 
So you see that this is the initial um, per water pressure profile. So at the time of heating of five day, there is a significant increase. And then over time, some of these uh, excess per water pressure dissipates. And um, similarly, we are looking at the shock to changes in shock resistance profiles for different types of heating. Uh, this is our initial um, um, uh, profile. And then, um, so here, when, um, um, so th this is the solution for the long term uh, steady state uh, profile. So, again, similarly, there is a significant um, increase um, when the time step reaches to um, five day, and then it, um, the shock resistance changes over time for the different times of heating. So, one might argue here that why 100 day, right? I've been I asked this question before. So, because, I mean, so one may argue that, okay, so we, are, we won't be injecting or extracting heat for 100 days straight at the constant temperatures like I presented here. But don't forget, we want to uh, investigate the worst case scenario situation, worst case scenarios, especially when we put the climate change into the equation and the, the extreme heating events, extreme geo events or extreme weather events. So we will have to consider uh, all those uh, worst case scenarios in our simulations and also in our design. So then finally, we wanted to move on to the 3D uh, modeling. This is where we compare um, the axial strain observations from field scale constructed piles. Here, what is different um, is um, we also included the, the pipe flow, the heat, uh, the, the uh, pipe, uh, so, sorry, fluid circulation within the, the pipe that was embedded in the piles. So this, of course, included, it introduces one more um, complexity, complexity in our model but the model that we developed handled this situation very well. So you're looking at the initial and boundary conditions uh, and geometry of our model. And um, this is where, this is how we um, coupled um, the, the water flow uh, within the pipes. So the, um, the boundary condition is handled with the external temperatures and the fluid exiting temperatures and ex entering temperatures multiplied by the heat transfer coefficient of your system, pile, pipe, um, rebar, uh, and also soil system, which is a very complicated value. And um, so here we compared uh, the simulations with the study, actual study, um, a full-scale study um, in the literature. You, you can see that axial strains are comparable. Uh, from the observations and simulations, the shock resistance uh, match very perfectly. So there are some differences, discrepancies in the axial load. Um, we are not really sure about why it happened, but considering the magnitude of this difference, um, it didn't, um, it, uh, this was uh, negligible. So then the most exciting part of the presentation for me, at least I hope it's for you as well. So we instrumented energy foundations at the new civil and environmental engineering building at the UIUC. And this was completed in fall 2021. So this is, there's a um, background story here. So when I first hired three years ago, everyone was talking about this new building, the instrumented bridge, everyone's so excited about the, the design and everything. So then when I was hired and actually when I was interviewed by UIUC, so everyone was talking about this and said, okay, so what can you do to this building? Because there's a research, there, there, there's going to be a research component here. And I said, why not energy foundation? Because we would have it. I mean, I knew, I saw the plans, they showed me the plans, and I knew that there will be eight foundations, um, you know, in the design. And um, then I said, okay, why not convert? So with the support from the department and the exec executive director of and services um, who funded this um, conversion here. Um, so um, then we read the design and we um, put a um, additional order, work order uh, to install these piles, but no one knew nothing. 
by the way, about this concept, which is like one of the biggest challenges right now. This is why, um, you know, so this, um, it's like a no-brainer concept is not being implemented. I mean, of course, there are challenges depending on the, the, the what region you're at, you know, the, the local variables and, and such. But anyways, so regardless of these uh, of those challenges, I was able to um, convince everyone and got funding uh, to 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 utilize these foundations. So you're looking at the basement and foundation plan of the building. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight foundations planned uh, for this building. So the initial, my initial design included converting everything, all the um, uh, foundations here to become an energy foundation. But then the cost was too high. Again, it was too high because um, people were skeptical. People didn't know much about it. So that's why. So then we decided to convert these um, I mean, when I say convert, probably is the, the, not the right term, but utilize these foundations. Four of them here, they are supporting the columns of the new building. And this is the, the plan of the instrumented bridge. And these foundations are sitting in a gl stiff glacial till material. So when you, um, I, I looked at the drilling, I was there, I watched the whole foundation drilling. Um, and and then, so this is, yeah, very stiff glacial till, and there were some um, very soft um, um, clay, um, you know, um, clay layers uh, encountered during the drilling, which delayed the drilling a little bit. So, but um, anyways, nonetheless, they finished in two days. So here is like here is one of our foundation and energy foundation installation here. So this is the rebar cage, and this is where we uh, attach the high density polyethylene pipes. And then we also um, included some instrumentation um, within the piles. And this is the lowering of the rebar cage into the the shaft. So here is a closer look what we use for the instrumentation. So these orange cables are for the thermistor strings. So each string had different thermistors embedded at different depths. And these um, probably you're all familiar with this. These um, um, red cables are for the string gauges um, to, to, to monitor and to record the, the strains uh, within. And this nice um, black cable is for the um, fiber optic cable. Um, so this uh, allowed us uh, to collect continuous measurements of the temperature profile. And so just they we installed them as an alternate if anything happens to these uh, thermistor strings um, in the pile. So here are the, the heroes of this project in addition to the London engineering. So, um, so here you're looking at the nice bridge connecting um, New Mark Civil Engineering Laboratory and then the new Civil and Environmental Engineering Building. And so this was this was taken when the um, everything was still in construction, but right now every, um, the the building is open to uh, students. Uh, the classrooms classes are being taught uh, in this building at the moment. So one thing that I forgot to mention. So these energy foundations, what are we going to do with them, right? So they are designed to heat and cool the geotechnical engineering laboratory in the building, which was very exciting. And they, they designed it in a way that because this is a research project, um, so four foundations were not enough to, to, to heat and cool the whole building. So that's why we decided to design in a way that we have a bypass system that goes to geotechnical engineering laboratory. And so whenever we want to operate the energy foundations uh, and then, you know, monitor the temperatures and fluid temperatures and et cetera, um, so we can cancel the, the, the building heating and cooling system and we can only operate this uh, energy foundations. Another thing to mention, um, so the installation in the subsurface, everything is done and then all this instrumentation, everything is fine. Um, but the heat pump is not installed yet, so that's why we cannot operate uh, them yet. So um, another um, opportunity came up. So we are using our campus as a living lab. 
uh, at University of Illinois. So there was another project, but this was solely ground source heat pump to support, um, to provide heating and cooling to the, another new building, campus instructional facility building on campus. This is um, the system, the system had, has 40 of 100 meet, meter deep boreholes in an array. And um, so, but initially before installing this, we installed a 120 meter deep test borehole. This is where we had the chance to collect core samples, you know, um, they monitor the temperatures, uh, the, the temperature profiles, and perform a thermal response test. I did not mention that thermal response test, but it's used to characterize the, uh, the thermal properties of the ground. Um, if you have any questions about it, I can explain more at the end of my presentation, or I can provide you more information if you reach out to me. So this opportunity here, so that you're looking at the subsurface in, uh, on campus, this is mainly till. And what we are interested for our deep foundation, uh, energy foundation project is the first uh, 20 to 30 meter. So these are all till layers uh, and we collected those core samples and we went to the lab and we um, um, identified, we characterized the thermal properties of those cores um, and so, by the way, this building is just um, not even a block away from the new um, civil and environmental engineering building. So they are the the subsurface here is representative of what we what we saw uh, on 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 our project. So then, another interesting study that we we performed here. Um, so we in we measured the hydro conductivity of the core samples for different till layers at different um, lateral stresses um, to consider the if there's any effect uh, of the confining pressures and also at higher temperatures. Uh, so we heated these um, uh, core samples up to 49 degrees Celsius using this device. So here are some results. So these are the, uh, the hydraulic conductivity values with different temperatures at different confining stresses for different samples. And this is the hydraulic conductivity evolution. Um, so we took the samples, we started room temperature, we cooled them down, we heated them back to the, the temperature and then up to 49 degrees Celsius and then back to um, the room temperature. So we observe that, so this is a time series um, where we calculated the hydraulic conductivities using the output volume. And um, so here, um, so at the time of the heating, you see that, that there is a significant decrease in, um, um, sorry, significant increase in hydraulic conductivity. So this may alter and change the behavior, pour, pour water pressure development, and also dissipation uh, very near the pile. So then we took our uh, the geometry initial and boundary conditions and also all those layering that we observed in our project on campus. And um, we investigated, um, we, we incorporated this, we developed a constitutive uh, equation uh, for temperature dependent, uh, temperature and also confining pressure dependent hydraulic conductivity. And we used this constitutive model and we consider this changing stratigraphy layered, uh, increasing with soil stiffness and with depth into our numerical model to, to elaborate what we would expect uh, from the behavior of our foundations. Again, I know to, to, too much numerical simulation, but they're all backed up uh, with either initial conditions or even um, other studies uh, in the literature. So here again, so we model the, 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 the pipe flow, um, the changes, the, the thermal hydromechanical behavior of pile and the ground and such. So this is a 3D simulation, but you're looking at the cut plane uh, in this axis here. So you see the, the temperature um, evolution uh, over time during the heat, heat injection. One thing that I forgot to mention, um, so these piles were, um, were uh, installed different type of loops. So there were two of them. So one is just like two continuous loop and the other one was three continuous loops. So there's one inlet, it travels through the cage and then outlet, but three loops, right? 
So that means we have uh, much more uh, context space in this uh, in this three loop case with the surrounding. So that would increase the uh, heat uh, exchange rate with the uh, surrounding. So here you're looking at the um, pore water pressure evolution during heat in injection, and you see that excessive pore, higher pore water pressures developed uh, in the case of um, you know the third layer here. So compared to the um, the other layers above, and um, so this is for okay. So then we did some um, so we we plotted the temperature profiles, the radial profiles, and also horizontal profiles for different times of uh, heating. So you said as the time increased, of course, the soil temperature increased. And there was a uniform temperature distribution uh, within the pile. So what about displacements? So these are to compare the two loop and three loop. We wanted to understand the differences. As you can see, at the end of the 100 days of heating, the maximum displacement at the pile head was, um, so this is the initial, it's like um, um, minus one, which is very like negligible compared to the um, the three loop um, um, the pile here. So pore water pressure um, uh, horizontal profiles, of course, as expected, as we observed before. So we observed the maximum pore water pressures at the very early time of heating. So then this pore water pressure dissipated when they uh, when it reached to 100 days. So these are just profiles for different depths. So as you can see, as the depth increased, the the um, the pore change in pore water pressure increased. So this was for the two loop and three loop, same observation. Just just the difference was the excess pore water pressures was a little bit higher in the case of um, three loop. And here you're looking at um, the, the pressure um, the vertical profiles. It's the same observation here, of course. Um, higher pore water pressures were developed um, in the three loop foundation compared to the two loop. The stresses, um, so this is the, for example, for the two loop initial stress profile. So there were, of course, thermally induced axial increased axial stresses within the pile. And same uh, applies for the three loop. And similarly, shock resistance profile uh, were uh, changes in shock resistance uh, profiles were observed for the two and three loop. Um, one thing to mention here: uh, the 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 magnitude of the ex changes in axial stresses and shock resistance were a little bit higher in the case of three loop foundations. So then we heated it for a hundred days, and then of course during the um, the winter time, so we are continuously extracting heat from the subsurface, therefore we are cooling our pile and the ground. So we want to simulate that the heat extraction period. So the, more, the most significant change in temperature was observed at earlier times of cooling. Again, the temperature, um, so this is the initial temperature profile at the end of heating and we started cooling this way. The temperature were not temperatures were not that uniform um, at the early times, but then it became uniform later on. And uh, axial stresses uh, were recovered, and also shock resistance as well. And um, we are looking at the pore water pressures uh, profiles, radial and horizontal profiles. Here, one interesting um, observation is that. So this is the um, the starting point for the cooling, which is which was the heating. So because of the temperatures, you see that the temperatures went down to um, six degrees Celsius, which was much lower than the initial temperatures, um, which was uh, 12 degrees Celsius. So therefore, the pore water pressures were um, much lower. Um, a, at the very early times of um, cooling. So this also gives us a chance to investigate how the hydraulic conductivities evolve you know, over time and for different depths. So we, we saw um, a, a major differences, um, sorry, not major, but small differences in hydraulic conductivity as well. So, so this is what we observed and what we simulated for our subsurface profile 
in in Midwest in Illinois. So what would we expect if we were to design the these um, energy foundations in the city of New York? So here the soil profiles are almost, I mean, I'm talking about the campus, uh, but also um, Urbana Champaign, um, it's, it's mainly glacial tills, right? But in New York, uh, so you have different soil profiles, including contaminated soil profiles. So the question for you to, to consider when you're designing your pile, would properties change over time? For example, would heating, because I just showed you that the properties of the ground changes with heating and cooling, right? So what, what happens in the case of contaminated soil profiles? So would there be um, accelerated changes, like abrupt ch changes uh, in the properties? When I say property in design, we do care about the thermal properties also. Um, uh, that's the thermal properties, like thermal conductivity is the most significant um, design parameter, right? So what would happen to the soil profile? And also another thing that actually hinders um, energy uh, foundation development in the city of New York, as to my knowledge, you, most of you know better than me, um, space limitations, right? So we have enough piles for the whole building to meet the heating and cooling demand of the building. So as I just explained, uh, I, as I just told you the story uh, about my experience in the field, um, so there is a lack of familiarity with the concept, So, in this, especially on the contractor side. So when we don't know, uh, when we don't have much information about a concept or a new technology, we of course refrain ourselves. Um, it's, it's, it's our um, defense mechanism, right? So we, we, we do it um, uh, not on purpose. So um, unfamiliar with the concept, um, it's hindering the development of the, and uh, also promotion uh, of the energy foundation installation in various, um, regions in the United States. Um, so these are, you know, a couple of things for you to think about. And especially here, I mean, you, we don't know. So we can maybe, um, you know, treat the contaminated soils and also um, get our contractors or, you know, designers familiar with the concept, but we don't, we can't do much about the space, right? So, um, so therefore, so this leads us to, this should lead us like researchers like me to, to, to engineer those piles or soils to, to, to provide a better solution uh, for you. There's a couple of key takeouts here before I give you the bonus uh, slide at the end. Um, so our fully coupled model, we're performing excellent. And um, so that, you know, all those, um, different parameters and, you know, um, constitutional laws and also um, different um, properties that we consider was um, very helpful and it contributed to the multiphysics. And as for the energy foundations, of course, for water pressures uh, was affected by the rate of heating and also the hydraulic properties of the soil. So the consideration here uh, of the temperature and stress dependent um, constituted um, soil hydraulic conductivity resulted in non-uniform pressure distribution, which is something that we should be careful about. And high pore water pressures were generated in the case of low hydraulic conductivity soils and high rates of um, heating. So your bonus slide here. So I was at the um, Energy Foundations Committee meeting uh, of DFI yeah, yesterday. So the, the DFI Energy Foundation Committee Chair Tony Amos shared the slide with the, the, the with the rest of the committee. So I just thought that it would be very nice because this is an upcoming project in New York City, and so this is from Endurant um, Energy in Westchester County. So here are some um, information about the project. So the system size 4 to 20 tons, if you're not familiar with the conversion, one ton equals to um, 12,000 BTU. And um, the solution provided here, the ground source and air source heat pump system. And you see the carbon reserve reduction, so 6 to 7% against baseline. And one important thing here is the, the incentive value. So it is 
about the, the project cost, the capital cost, uh, it's more than 6.5 million and almost half of it is intensified. So um, this is like a very huge motivation to, to install more uh, energy foundations in the city of New York. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and thank you for bearing with me until the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, so you can reach me out at this email address. You can find more information about my research. And also, you can also call me directly by my office phone. Um, thank you so much again for the invitation. It was a um, great pleasure for me. All right. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, I thought it was a great talk. Very interesting stuff. Thank you.